Eve Diane got it. No. Oh. oh. <laughs> we were, I wasn't going to bring any meat. I thought we'd just forget about it and eat deer today, but uh, that would eliminate a few people who can't eat Bambi. You have to notice in today's paper this week, Kate Bird, because his friends, he turned down Thanksgiving. Christmas decorations are going up this week. Lydia is going to put up the tree on Saturday. I'm sitting back in that corner there, but you see, since the windows are not covered, no one's going to see it next time. So we need to do two things. We need to put two red large wreaths outside, one on the front and one on that side. I thought if we could put maybe the one or the other with a floodlight on it, and the other would be a um, light center in it, if someone would like to um, make those up, why... That would be very fine. I just mentioned it. Whether we have them or not is not a big deal, but it just would lend itself uh, to the decor of the uh, of the uh, area. Who knows? Uh, they may steal them the first week, but we don't know. Uh, but it'd be nice. Anyone who could help uh, decorate on Saturday, uh, if you'd like to, uh, I'm sure we have a lot of of decorative material. We've got these long garlands that could go all around. It adds to the festivity of the of the time. A lot of people are critical of uh, those of us who um, realize that Christmas, December 25th, was probably not the date that the Lord Jesus Christ was born. And he was born in late September or early October, as far as the calendar is concerned. And because there's so much made of the phoniness of Christmas, they say drop it out, but we're not that stupid. We take the best that the world has to offer and enjoy some of the festivities, but we don't fool around and uh, misuse the date. So uh, uh, we enjoy having it. We're talking about inspiration. This is a this is apropos, although it's not from the Bible class. I just thought you'd be interested. Wayne found it in uh, in one of his papers and uh, gave it to me. I thought you might like to hear what some people say or think. When the Reverend John Shelby Spong, Episcopal Bishop of Newark, New Jersey, writes a book, you can bet the homestead that it will be a church boiler. For instance, his latest book, Born of Woman, a Bishop Rethinks the Birth of Jesus. Spong speculates in this that Jesus may have been married. And of course, Spong says, the woman he was married to was Mary Magdalene, whom the church has painted with a wide scarlet brush down through the centuries. Spong 61 says such negative views of Mary Magdalene are pure nonsense. The only indications that Mary Magdalene ever even had problems, he says, are a short gospel passage that says she was a sinner and another passage that says that Jesus cast seven demons out of the woman. But Spong sees other positive indications that Mary Magdalene could have been the wife of Jesus. For instance, when the Gospel writers list the contingent of women who followed Jesus and the disciples, Mary Magdalene is always mentioned first. Given the many prohibitions on single Jewish women in those days, Spong says the women following Jesus could have been mothers, wives, or prostitutes. Spong thinks that Peter and some of the other disciples had wives who followed along. What then was the role of Mary Magdalene? Bible says the women provided for them out of their means, and in every account, Mary Magdalene is a central figure. Even at the tomb of the crucifixion, the focus is on Mary Magdalene. She tells an angel inside the tomb that someone has taken away her Lord, which would have been a common reference to a husband in those days, Spong says. And when she sees a mysterious figure outside the tomb, whom she believes is the gardener, she lays claim to the body of Jesus, which of course would be the man's the duty of a man's wife. Spong, a well-known and controversial liberal, talks about the narrative that describes the moment after the resurrection, when Jesus sees Mary and greets her by the name, greets her by name. Mary responds, Rabboni, an intimate reference to Jesus' teaching role. Apparently, Mary then moves toward Jesus to embrace him, and Jesus says, "Do not embrace me, or do not cling to me." In Orthodox Jewish circles, Spong says, women did not embrace men unless they were married, and then only in the privacy of their homes. 
Strong contends that the wedding at Cana of Galilee was actually the wedding of Jesus and Mary Magdalene. The bishop notes that only likely, the only likely time that Jesus' mother and all of his friends would have been at the same wedding was when Jesus himself got married. And he wonders why Jesus' mother became so upset when the wine was running low, probably because she was the hostess of her own son's wedding. Otherwise, as an ordinary guest, her behavior would have been inappropriate. He doesn't understand the isagogics of the situation. He's an idiot. But this is not frivolous speculation, Spong says, but serious scholarship. Nuts. That looks beyond the biblical text to see how the church over the centuries has suppressed women. He concludes his chapter on the married Jesus with a charge that the real Mary Magdalene was excised from holy stories as a way of denying women their true sexual nature. Balderdash. By the turn of the first century, there was in the life of the Christian church a clear need to remove Mary Magdalene, the flesh and blood woman who was at Jesus' side in life and in death, and to replace her with a sexless woman, the virgin mother. The record of history is that this was accomplished by portraying Magdalene as a prostitute and thus assassinating her character. During an interview, Spong said that early in the church's history, there were only two appropriate ways for a woman to live out her sex life. You could be a virgin and join, or, and join a nunnery, or you could be a mother and only use sex for procreation. But that view of human sexuality just doesn't wash with women of this day, he says, and that's one of the reasons the Christian church is facing enormous conflict. So change the Bible to make it fit, right? The church is declining and we spend too much time trying to keep the insecure secure, Spong says. We have to start going beneath the words of the Bible and experience the reality and find a way to talk about it. I want to emphasize these, this, these words because we're studying the doctrine of inspiration. We have to start going beneath the words of the Bible and experience the reality and find a way to talk about it. That, you see, is one of the great heresies of the day that has come to us and one of the things that we're teaching against as far as Scripture is concerned. So, open the word of truth this morning to St. Peter chapter 1. We'll continue our study of the doctrine of inspiration. Every believer is a priest, and every believer priest has the privilege of personally and privately preparing himself for the study of the Word of God using rebound if necessary, which is more than the confession of all known sin, so that you may be filled or controlled by God the Holy Spirit and therefore taught by Him. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, to thank you very much for the privilege of being together in this place at this time to study together the word of the living God. We recognize that you have told us that you have magnified your word above your name, that the word of God is forever settled in heaven. This magnificent word in the original autographs, the manuscripts, were given to the church in the, at the beginning are, is uh, special, unique, and is precious in your eyes. And therefore, we uh, today study it very carefully because we realize the, re the source of it and the power that is inherent in it. And so we decide time to give ourselves to that which is going to build us up uh, as members of the royal family of God and give us inheritance which is among all those who are believers. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, <clears throat> let me remind that you're all invited to stay even if you haven't up for uh, the uh, dinner, Thanksgiving dinner, which will follow the second class. The doctrine of inspiration. We have uh, noted this is the second in... Uh, uh, the doctrines that we're studying, the first doctrine was the doctrine of revelation. God it revealed the Word of God. That is revelation. This He revealed everything that God wanted known about the Word of God. Everything that God wanted known about anything as far as uh, his, uh, the principles of the mind of God is concerned. These were revealed to certain select men, and it came into the soul of this man. We do not know how God did it in every case. You know, in the case of the Apostle Paul, who wrote the book of Galatians, which we are studying currently, that it is of the ministry 
of God the Holy Spirit in a uh, two-year uh, Bible class in the desert. But it became a part of the soul of these men. That is revelation. Uh, as it was cycled through their soul, it became a part of their frame of reference, and then they exhaled it through uh, what they wrote uh, is uh, called inspiration in that God, the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit, protected what they wrote from all error. So when they, when they wrote the original scripture, uh, it absolutely had any kind of the science or whatever it touches. Then the ministry of God, the Holy Spirit, and she revelation protected by inspiration in which he made clear to the soul of the individual who studies it by means of the doctrine of illumination. The unbeliever so that he may believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. To the believer, he said, takes Bible God and makes it understandable so that the believer can use the image of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So you have inspiration, illumination, three parts of the puzzle. And the Holy Spirit is responsible for all three areas because he is the a member of the Godhead to whom has been the responsibility for making known or revealing the mind, the plan. God the Father planned, God the, Spirit, God the Holy Spirit reveals it. That's the threefold work of the Holy Spirit as far as the Word of God is concerned. We looked in our last class at the passage of Scripture, uh, which is uh, uh, given to us uh, for our study in 2 Timothy 3.16, which says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And so we took the word inspiration because it is incorrect. However, we use it all the time. If we used uh, the correct word, nobody would understand it. And the word inspiration is uh, this word... In the Greek, T H E O P N E U S P O S, Theonustas. This is the word God. Theos is the word for God. Nustas means to breathe. The word actually means God breathed. And we studied that very carefully uh, what it means when God says that it is God breathed. And it's a unique word, never used by classical Greeks and it used only one place in Scripture, therefore it's a hapax legomena, and we realize that God used a very unique word uh, to describe how the Word of God was given. And remember that it is true of all Scripture. Now that, with that in mind, we're ready to move on to the next increment, which is Second Peter chapter 1, verse 21, where it says in the uh, reading from the uh, New International Version, uh, for prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. By the way, uh, after we finish the doctrine of inspiration, and so we'll get down to discussing the merits of the four major versions of Scripture which are used today. The King James Version, the New King James Version, the New International Version, and the New American Standard Bible. Uh, and uh, give you, I'll tell you the difference between them, uh, which is superior, which is inferior, and why. You can use the version you like. It's up to you. But you ought to know the difference between them. You need to know that there's a literal translation and a dynamic translation, for example. And you aren't going to hear that in 99% of the places because nobody cares, but I care. We care around here what you know, and so we teach you something that's worthwhile. And so I trust that you'll be alert to find out what it is that makes the difference between the various translations. And those are only four of perhaps a hundred translations we have today. Everything from an outright paraphrase, which is not a translation, to a, a strict translations, and they're all available to you today. But in this case, let's note what God is talking about uh, in, this, in this passage. Uh, when he says this, uh, for prophecy, we're now dealing with an interesting word. 
A prophecy which looks like this in the uh, original Greek. Pardon me. P R O P H E T E I A, prophetia, has several meanings. It can refer to the Old Testament prophecies or foretelling, for that's where we get the word pro, uh, pro the foretelling of the future. Not necessarily all it means. The word is used to describe Old Testament authors because every author of the Old Testament either was a prophet or had the, the gift of prophecy. One or the other. David was not a prophet, but he had the gift of prophecy. Every author of the Old Testament scripture was either a prophet or had the gift of prophecy. For example, wrote the first five books of the Bible. He had the gift of prophecy. David wrote a great number of things, and we looked at a, a passage of scripture that describes how David uh, received the word from God. So you have uh, the Old Testament prophets. We also noted under the uh, passage, all scripture is given by inspiration of God from the point of all scripture that, the, uh, uh, that it refers to a good portion of the New Testament writings. Particularly because we noted that uh, 2 Timothy was one of the last book that Paul wrote and a good portion of the New Testament had already been written. And Paul knew it. And we, we looked at the passage which uh, indicated that Paul considered the book of Luke scripture. And that could be included in the word of prophecy as well. Uh, and Peter uh, considered all of Paul's writings scripture. So we recognize that it could include a good portion of the New Testament writings. And Lewis Perry Chafer uh, concludes... Uh, that uh, it is that 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 is uh, indeed the case, and so when it talks about for uh, prophecy uh, did not come about from the source of the will of man, but holy men uh, uh, spake. Well, the uh, that's not exactly what word I used to, it does not look like it appears twice. It looks like this. Pardon me. Pharaoh. This Greek verb is uh, uh, appears first as an aorist, uh, pardon me, passive, indicative, and then as a present, active, participle. Now the New International Translators translated the aorist indicative as had origin, and they translate the second one the present active participle as carried along. The difference has to do with the tense and the, the voice. Uh, actually, the word uh, does mean uh, to be uh, uh, born, to be carried, uh, to be, uh, sometimes it can mean to, to be held. Uh, it also has the meaning of impulse, depending on the context. And uh, so here is the general meaning. But the meaning of the word is determined also by the tenses. Uh, the aorist tense refers to an occurrence, something that has taken place. Uh, the aorist passive voice, the passive voice tells us that the subject receives the action of the, the active voice. The subject produces the action of the verb. Now, the subject in the first place uh, has to do with uh, prophecy. Uh, and this is a negative. You have the negative uh, along with the negative. Okay. And so it's going to be, but it's a uh, prophecy. Uh, uh, occur, uh, not was born along the uh, from a, the source of the will of man. The passive voice, uh, prophecy is the subject, receives the action of the verb. And so... Uh, the translation of the New International is not bad. It never, the, the, the uh, here's your negative, had its origin uh, or uh, received its imp uh, the impulse or the for here you have received. You have received because some uh, prophets did not receive the impulse from the source of men. Uh, the will of the uh, will of the is the, uh, uh, and the present participle 
uh, always refers to something which is uh, going on. Uh, it, uh, it may be at that moment and continuing, or it may be continuous at different points. Okay, this is something which was uh, continuous in the past because it covers a long period of time. It covers this prophecy uh, to describe the prophecies which came. And the Bible was written over 1,600 plus years by 40 different authors. And yet it is all a part of one wonderful book that is formed by the so by the, from the source of men who were uh, carried along uh, by the Holy Spirit. They were born along. Uh, the present tense indicates that uh, this was a continuous thing. And the participle is uh, uh, nomic for a principle uh, of, of life. So the authors of Scripture, it tells us here, uh, did not write from the source of the will of man, but they wrote from the source of being carried along or born along by God, the Holy Spirit. And this is rather amazing if you put it into its context. What is the context? Well, the context is, uh, begins in verse 16, where the Apostle Peter says something rather startling. He says, we did not follow cleverly, cleverly invented stories when we told you about the, the uh, power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This was not uh, a myth uh, or a fable. Muthos, the Greek, Greek word which is translated stories, is, uh, is the muthos from which we get the word myth or a story. And he's correctly translated cleverly invented stories. And we did not follow that. But he says in the last part of verse 16, we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Here is the eyewitness speaking. Then he says this, for he received honor and glory from God the Father. When the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, this is my beloved son with whom I love and with whom I am well pleased. Verse 18 says, We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were here, we were with him on the sacred mountain. Then he makes a startling statement. He says, But we have a more firm or more sure or more reliable. The word is babaios. Looks like this in the Greek. B-E-B-A-I-O-S. Babaios. Secure is the best word for it. More, uh, King James translated more secure. We have a more secure uh, word. Uh, New, New American Standard says, uh, and so we have the prophetic word made more sure. Uh, that's, that's supposed to secure. Isn't it? Then that's what exactly what it means. We have a more sure word. That, what, what in the world, beloved? Here is a voice that comes from heaven. And he says, a, more sure, a voice from heaven. And that is the word of God. And that's something that you never want to forget. Because there are all kinds of idiots walking around today who have the name DD or PhD after them or REV in front of their names, Reverend, who tell you that God is there. Nothing. The word Amen was written to the last book of the Bible. God does not speak any longer. Has been to us the written word of God, which is more sure than anything. I was in a service one time and I saw the pastor stand up behind the sacred desk and he, he closed the Bible and he said, I, I'm not going to speak from the Word, I'm going to speak from my heart. Let me tell you, the Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. He doesn't deserve to be heard. When he's speaking from his heart, he needs to speak from the Word of God. Thus saith the Lord makes the, uh, the ministry of the Word the only thing that is viable. Who cares what a man has to say? It's irrelevant and immaterial. But when God speaks through the written word, we had better listen. There are all kinds of people out there who are sitting under people who are pretending to have a pipeline from heaven. And they are manipulating people. They're using people. They're destroying people. You get a pastor who gets up and says, well, last night when I was praying, 
God spoke to me and told me I should do this and our church should do so and so. What are you going to do, argue with him? Are you say, well, God didn't speak to you? No, you better do it or else. And pastors have led churches to do all kinds of weird things, stupid things. My authority in this congregation comes not from the fact that you have elected me as the pastor 24 years ago. From the fact only one place, and that is that I teach you what the Bible says and anything else is not pertinent. It's what the Bible says. It's not some kind of uh, ritual that we go through. It's not some kind of pipeline from heaven. My job is to find out what the Word of God says, to teach you what it says from the original languages, to put it together in categorical form, and to give it to you. And let me tell you, that's not an easy task. It's a big, it's a big job. Sometimes it takes many more hours than you would ever realize. I'll spend hours on one word or one verse and teach it in just a couple of moments. Why? Because I must be sure what it says before I share it with you. I'm not going to fool around with that. But the strongest testimony of Scripture uh, comes to us from Peter himself. That we heard a voice from heaven, but we have a more sure word of prophecy. For prophecy did not have its origin in the uh, uh, prophet's own interpretation, for prophecy never had its origin, never had its origin, from the source of men. But men, as they were born along or carried along by God the Holy Spirit, recorded in the original autographs, the original manuscripts, what God wanted recording. Dr. Chafer says uh, in his systematic theology in answer to the question, how did he do it? As to how the direct revelation was given to the human author, none other than God and the elect man could know. It was wholly within those personal and sacred relationships into which none other might intrude. Here the devout soul will hesitate and the prudent will at least respect the silence of God. Amen. I, I, that's right. The prudent will respect the silence of God. If God hasn't told us how, he did it. We had better not speculate how it was done. What God has wanted us to know is recorded in the Word. What God does not want us to know we do not need to know. In fact, we're never told how God performed any miracle. There's no miracle that, that God tells us how he did it. That's why, according to 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith and not by sight. He discounts several theories or suppositions when he says, to the ones who are zealous for the authority of Scripture and who have therefore concluded that the men were more or less automatons or robots, the error is that they fail to see the human side of inspiration. Others allege that men wrote under exalted human faculties and superior poetic genius. This eliminates the divine authorship. Some would say that inspiration rendered the authors infallible which also discounts the human side. Actually, limit, inspiration was limited only to what they recorded as Scripture. Anything else they said or wrote is subject to human error of every kind. And so we draw this conclusion. The principle, the authors of Scripture were preserved from error in what they wrote in Scripture. But they did not originate the message. They were rendered accurate in declaring their own thoughts, and at the same time, they were accurate in declaring God's thoughts, which they received from Him. For ever, and we'll deal with this. One of the next, the next point has to do, or a couple points down, has to do with the dual authorship. That is, these men who recorded 
the scripture used their own personality. They used their own vocabulary. They used their own experiences. All of these were used when they wrote the scripture. So that what they're recording is not something foreign, but the God, the Holy Spirit, at the same time, protected what they wrote and brought out what God wanted recorded as far as the scripture is concerned. Let's look at it for a couple of other verses. Turn to John chapter 10, the Gospel of John chapter 10. In, the, in chapter 10, our Lord Jesus Christ is dealing with the unbelief of the Jews. In the, the city of Jerusalem, our Lord has come face to face with uh, these teachers. And uh, in verses, and we're not reading the whole thing, we're just picking uh, out something apart from what he has said. In verses 34 and 35, it says this, Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I have said you are gods? If he called them gods, to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, what about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Now, I'm, I just want to pick out the part of the, spray, the, 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 the clause that he interjects right in the middle of uh, in his answer to these men. The scripture cannot be broken. In this passage, the Lord Jesus Christ states that their law is scripture and that the scripture cannot be broken which says that the Lord Jesus Christ accepted the Old Testament for the Old Testament is known in several ways it may be known by the term law or the law may refer to the first five books or it may refer to the, uh, the everything except the prophets. So sometimes it says the law and the prophets, and that refers to the whole Old Testament. Uh, on the other hand, sometimes it says the law, the prophets, and the writings, and that refers to the whole Old Testament. The context tells you uh, what he's talking about. But our Lord Jesus Christ accepted the Old Testament as a whole, as well as in the separate portions of it. And uh, uh, he recognized here that it is one complete unit. A turn to uh, Luke chapter 24. The Lord Jesus Christ is on the road to Emmaus at his resurrection, where he meets some of the disciples who had uh, uh, seen his crucifixion. And in verse uh, uh, 20, uh, well, let's look about, um, let's start in verse 17 and we'll skip a few things. Uh, he joins himself to them, you see. Uh, and in verse 14, they were talking to each other about everything that happened. As they discussed these things, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they, they were kept from recognizing him. Then he asks them a question. Uh, what are you discussing together as you walk along? And uh, one of them answered, well, uh, are you only a visitor to Jerusalem? You don't know what, what's happened? And he says in verse 19, what things? Uh, they replied about Jesus of Nazareth. And then describe something about him, you see. And then about his death on the cross. And then he says, in beginning in verse 25, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. And then he quotes some of the things that the prophets said. Verse 27, And beginning with Moses and 
the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. You see, he declared what the scriptures said concerning him so that when they finally got there, they had a tremendous Bible class from the Lord himself. Turn to John chapter 5. After the healing of the man at the pool of Bethesda, the Lord Jesus Christ is called into question for what he has done. And in chapter 5, verse 36, he's now answering the question about the testimonies that are about him. And he said, I have testimony which is much weightier than that of John. Because the Father, verse 37, who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You've never heard his voice, nor you've seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you. But you see, verse 39, you diligently study the scripture because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. You see what he says in verse 39? That, uh, yeah, see, they venerated the Scripture, but they didn't believe the Scripture. They didn't obey it. And he says, these are the Scriptures that testify of me. The Scriptures do testify of me. But you don't believe what the Scripture says. And so our Lord Jesus Christ can, uh, personally places his stamp on the Scripture. There are many other places, and they all be con uh, they are, are all in the book. And for those who are have joined us by television or by radio, we invite you to write for the exposition of Galatians. We are now in the second volume of our word by word, verse by verse categorical study of the book of Galatians, and this entire series uh, on the doctrine of inspiration is included in this book. We simply ask you to write for it. There's no charge. Uh, no one will call on you. You'll not get a letter dunning you for money or anything else like that. We simply make it available on a grace basis if you'd like to have it. But in it, all these verses will be given to you. Uh, I'll just mention them to you. Mark 14, 49, John 13, 18, John 17, 12, uh, John 12, 14, Mark 9, 12, and 13. Uh, uh, then uh, uh, also uh, in... Uh, uh, John 4, 4, 7, and 10, John 19, 4, John 21, 13, and 42, John 22, 29, and John 26, 31, and 56. All of these are records of the Lord Jesus Christ and his authentication of the Word of God. He accepted the Old Testament, and the New Testament was written at his direction. A couple of other passages before we move on. Galatians chapter 3, the passage, of course, that we're dealing with uh, in Galatians 1, verses 11 and 12, make it very clear that the Apostle Paul says that what he is writing didn't come from man, but came from God. But in Galatians chapter 3, verse 8, he says, the scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announced the gospel to Abraham in advance. Now just hold the phone a minute. Stop. Wait a minute. Stop. Think for yourself. I'm, a, I'm challenging you here. Think here. How did God announce to Abraham what he was supposed to do? Was it by a written word? No, it wasn't. It was by his own voice. It was by what he said. The Shekinah glory appeared to Abraham in Ur of the Chaldees and told him what to do. The scripture had not yet been written, but God spoke to Abraham. And when it was recorded, what God said to Abraham, what is it called? By this passage, by Paul, it's called scripture. The same thing is true of Romans chapter 9, verse 17. 
The scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this purpose. Yet in Exodus 9.16, it was Moses who made that declaration to Pharaoh. The scripture had not been written yet. Nevertheless, the word of God, whether spoken or written, is the identification of God himself and has equal authority, and God places it that way. There are a number of passages which I will give to you. Now turn, please, to 1 Corinthians. Chapter 2. Here is the most magnificent passage that could be taken in one context to show you the thrilling things that God has done as far as giving us the Word of God in written form. Beginning in verse 6. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that God, that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. The scripture is forever settled in heaven. N verse 8, none of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it stands permanently written, Isaiah 64, 4, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Now notice the negatives here. That which is he's talking about cannot be perceived by eye or ear. That is empiricism. Then he goes on to say, no mind has conceived. That is rationalism. And don't be fooled, this is not talking about heaven. This is talking about the, the scripture. I mean, I've seen it taken out of context so many times it, it disgusts me. The whole heaven is no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and they rattle their uh, tongues around in their head and wave their arms. Ridiculous! This is not talking about heaven. Why? Because the next verse says, but God has revealed them to us. The things that cannot be understood by empiricism, by rationalism, have come to what? Revelation. There's the first of the things we talked about. The doctrine of revelation. Now how does, it, how does this take place? Well, that begins in verse 10b. The Spirit, ah, there you have it, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. The Holy Spirit knows exactly everything, because He is God. Verse 11, for who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now, verse 12, we have received the Spirit of the Cosmos Diabolicus, the world system, but the Spirit who is from God, that, that we may understand what God has freely given us. Now you have the Holy Spirit giving this to certain men. That's the authors of Scripture. That's what he says in verse 13. This is what we speak. This is what we communicate. And not in words taught by human wisdom. We're this, the, and here is the verbal inspiration of Scripture. Not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit. And then he says, combining what? Or putting together, uh, expressing spiritual truth in spiritual words. God takes spiritual truth and... These are expressed in spiritual words. There you have the doctrine of inspiration. God protecting, God protecting what these men communicate. So that the very words, while they're the words of men, are also the words of God. Now the third thing is illumination, and it goes on. But, but what? The man without the spirit, the sukikos man, the soulish man. King James says the natural man. 
New American Standard says Ameri the natural man refers to the, the, the unsaved person, the person who doesn't have the Holy Spirit. The unsaved person does not understand the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. They, neither can he understand them because they are spiritually discerned. But, verse 15, the spiritual man, the man who is controlled by God the Holy Spirit, this is illumination, makes judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject to judgment of any man. There you have all three. You have revelation, you have inspiration, you have illumination, all put together in one place to show you how the Scripture was provided for us so that we have uh, something which is totally and completely reliable. If... you had received something very, very special, a communication from someone very special, you would keep it. I... I have a little file in my in my desk in my file cabinet, a little one that has it says it simply says one thing on it. It says quail, and in it contains all of the correspondence down through the years that I've had with Dan. Whether he ever amounts to president or anything else, he has been in historically the vice president of the United States, and it's very important. And I I just feel like it's something that uh, is worthwhile keeping. My correspondence with the Vice President of the United States when he was just Dan, first of all, and then Congressman, then Senator, then Vice President. And I, I, I treasure them. I think they're very, very uh, wonderful. And from time to time, I look in there to see some of the, uh, the places we have come together. And it's, it's very important to me. But I don't study it all the time, very, very rarely. I have another file. Say, it's entitled Letters from Bob. It's my son, Robert, when he was in the Marine Corps, uh, as a young man of uh, 18 to 22, and some of the letters that he wrote to me. I, have, I treasure them. I keep them. Uh, they're, they're sentimental reasons that I keep them. Uh, but I don't read them regularly. But, beloved, here is something which has come from the God of the universe. And for many, many years, because of faulty translations and difficult translations and archaic translations, such as the King James Version, a lot of people have failed to understand the communique from God to earth. And they have neglected it. Or it has become something that they read like a good luck charm or like the sprinkling of, sprinkling of holy water. But this is meant to be understood by God's people. And it is the very revelation of the mind of God. In fact, in verse 16 of the passage we looked at, he says, We have the mind of Christ. If you want to think the mind of Christ after him, you think Scripture. Because that's what God calls the Scripture, the mind of Christ. And that's placing a tremendous emphasis upon the Word of God. It's no wonder, he says, I have magnified my word above my name. People treat it like they treat no other book. Oh, it's the bestseller still. But what, to become a, some decoration here or there? Something that the bride carries in her little white Bible, never to read it at all? something that you keep in case you're going to die, you got one foot in the grave and the other on a banana peel, and you quick grab the Bible for a verse of Scripture that will give you a little buoyancy. No, no. This is to, meant to be studied, for it gives us all things which are necessary for living and for God-likeness. Now, we're going to study some wrong attitudes toward Scripture. We're going to study the, some erroneous uh, ideas as to what does... Uh, what. what how the Bible came to us and how trustworthy it is and the dual authorship after we have a break and we'll be back for our second class. Now, thank you, Father, for our study. May God the Holy Spirit take these things and help us to appreciate the wonderful Word of God which you have given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. The pop machine is down simply because they're going to they have to fix something in there, and they want it to be empty. So we've done the. We, we still have some pop in there, but it's 
it's uh, down to its lowest right at this point in time.